until I smile. Welcome to the Kent State University Museum's exhibition, Fashions of the 40s, from World War II to the New Look. My name is Sarah Hume, I'm the curator of this exhibition, and I invite you to join me on a virtual tour. World War II imposed a lot of restrictions and limitations on people and on designers, but it did provide an opportunity for creativity, originality, and it gave the opportunity for American designers to work independently of French uh, in influence, which they had really been dominated by France before the war. So it was a time when there was a lighter, less structured design, which was really the aesthetic of American designers. One of the d American designers who emerged at this time was Pauline Trigère. She'd actually been born in France to Russian Jewish parents, but understandably, she left Europe in 1937 and settled in New York. The pieces that we have in our collection, we're really lucky to have very early Pauline Trigère from the 1940s. And the reason that we have such a great collection is that she was personal friends with Shannon Rogers and Jerry Silverman, who were the founders of the museum. So she donated not just her early pieces that we have um, in this exhibition, but also her sketchbooks, her ephemera, all of her archives were donated, and they're now at the, at the Fashion Library. So what we have here on exhibit are two of her pieces from the 1940s, a beautiful green jacket, which really showcases the style of the 1940s with its shoulder pads. Um, and then the other piece that we have is a delightful little navy blue cape. And the secret inside this navy blue cape is that it has a really bright lining that is striped. This section of the exhibition focuses on garments that were made and used during World War II itself, so from 1939 to 1945. And one of the things that limited people during this period, the United States imposed regulations called L85, which limited how much material designers could use in their clothing. Other countries, Germany, Great Britain, they imposed rationing, which limited how much clothing individuals could purchase. This imposed the regulations on manufacturers, people who made the clothes, rather than, um, of course, it trickled down to the consumers, but it wasn't necessarily um, forced on them in the same way. And one of the designers who worked during this period was Adrian. Adrian began his career as a costume designer in Hollywood. He was the head designer for MGM and is perhaps best known for his work on The Wizard of Oz. But he, in 1941, he left um, to become a fashion designer. And his designs really navigated the tricky waters of L85. So he made use, you can see in the, the gray suit behind me, how he has managed. Um, one of the things that's restricted is, the, is the, how much material is in the skirt. So it has to be a very narrow silhouette and he um, has made a very narrow silhouette on this skirt, and you're also limited in how much excess material you can use. So he's done the decoration by taking strips of the fabric and turning the orientation. So the striped material is then put at a different angle so the stripes run um, in contrast with the rest of the material. He really has navigated the, the uh, limitations imposed by L85 and made really beautiful designs. The black suit by Adrian behind me was, was made for Halley Brothers, and Halley Brothers is a department store in Cleveland, and many of the high-end designers would sell through these um, high-end department stores. And for instance, the gray suit was also Marshall Fields, which was the Chicago area department store. That's light and gay. L85 restrictions also applied to menswear, but you can see in these two examples of menswear that are in the exhibition, these two suits, they are probably after L85 expired. They're from the 1940s, but not during the war years. Um, you can tell because they have a lot of the features that L85 restricted. For instance, the um, cuffs on the pants were, were restricted. 
Um, I think there were restrictions on double-breasted suits and also the little pockets, the extra fabric for all of the pockets. So these suits have all of the elements that were restricted by, um, by the regulations. Um, but menswear um, was, some elements of it were, were adopted by women during the war years. Um, in, women began wearing trousers, uh, particularly if they were working in factories. Sometimes it was required wear for them to put on pants. Um, and also there was inspiration from, from certain celebrities. Um, Catherine Hepburn was one of the most well-known actresses in Hollywood, and she also had a tendency to wear pants. Um, and Catherine Hepburn's, her estate donated her collection of her performance clothes as well as her personal clothes to the Kent State University Museum. She had stipulated in her will that she wanted her collection that she had amassed over the course of her career, she wanted it to go to an educational institution and it wound up being donated to the Kent State University Museum. So we have about 700 pieces in our collection from Katherine Hepburn. And among them are a number, and I mean a number of pairs of khaki pants. She had a lot. Um, and this exhibition includes one of these pairs of brown pants um, paired with a button-down shirt that really was her style. She um, embraced this sort of gender-bending, um, provocative look. Um, and in it, during the war, because, of, because so many men were away and so many women had to take jobs, a lot of women adopted this kind of dress themselves. Hattie Carnegie was born Hattie Kannengeiser in Vienna, Austria in 1880. She went on to take the name Carnegie because it was the name of Andrew Carnegie, the richest man in the United States. She moved to the United States and she initially set up a millinery business, which she expanded into a dressmaking shop. She herself didn't actually sew, but she hired some great designers to, to head her brand. And among the people who got their start with her were James Galnos, Norman Norell, Pauline Trigger, and Claire McArdle. Her signature look was the suit, which was known as the Little Carnegie suit. We actually have two examples of suits here on exhibition. The first one is this black um, suit that has a wonderful cording embroidered decoration. And then the other one is this brown check suit. And the, high, the feature of this particular suit is the pocket, which is almost its own bag that sits separate from the suit, um, but is attached and has the button that closes it. One of the truly original American designers who got her start during this period was Claire McArdle. She had a looser, freer, sportier look than other designers who had gone before her. And you can compare, there's a great opportunity in this exhibition to compare the kind of dress that, that Claire McArdle created with this tan, um, loose-fitted dress um, and, and Dior dresses, this sort, of, this sort of quintessential French style, which was very structured, had very complicated understructure in the garment, and was very, was, um, was very sort of a fussy dress. And you can compare the difference between the loose style of Claire McArdle and the structured style of Dior.